A master of art has given us a picture which well represents the attitude of a higher critic toward the book of Daniel and its wonderful prophecies, which more clearly than any others point out our day, its present experiences, and what is to be expected. Round five, fight! In the apocalyptic imagination, history itself is a closed process. It will end, and then a new age, a new world order would begin. And the present age and the new age are qualitatively distinct. The present age is under the dominion of evil powers. In 1876, Russell had written an article in Bible Examiner entitled, Gentile Times, When Do They End? in which he stated that the seven times will end in 1914. Russell concluded on the basis of the tree dream recorded in Daniel chapter four, that the dynasty that began with King David would be restored 2,520 years after its overthrow. During those years, no Davidic king would rule. The Bible students referred to that period as the Gentile times. What would happen at the end of those years? We see it particularly in the apocalyptic writings outside of the Bible and in the New Testament. That power that has dominion over the present age is Satan. Satan is the archenemy of God. Right, the age to come will be free of all more, uh, evil, moral corruption, and death. Satan will be defeated. But God himself is the one who has to do this. God must intervene to bring the present age to a crashing halt and initiate this new world order. So let's turn now to Daniel for a full apocalyptic work. An Introduction to the Book of Daniel Daniel wrote this prophetic book in Babylon. He was taken to Babylon, likely as a young Judean prince, along with other nobles. In time, Daniel served as a government official for the Babylonians and later for the Medo-Persians. We have eight manuscripts of Daniel preserved from the group of texts known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Of these eight, the earliest fragments date to the late 2nd or early 1st centuries BCE. Daniel opens his book by relating events that began in 618 BCE when he was still a young man. He completed his writing in approximately 536 BCE. That's a whole lot of years. Um, and the historical inaccuracy of the work, right? You have the chronology of more than a century being telescoped here. Um, there's other inaccuracies. Belshazzar was actually never a king. He was sort of a, a prince regent. Um, he was defeated by Cyrus, not by Darius. So there, there are tremendous historical inaccuracy. And this is a sign that this was written at a much later time, looking back when the history of the period 300 years ago was very confused. If the book of Daniel had been written in the 6th century BCE, we would expect the writer to get historical details correct from the time and place in which he lived. While it might not be so problematic for the writer to get some contemporary details wrong, it would be very suspicious if he also got many of the details right about a time three centuries following his death. This, of course, is what we see in the book of Daniel. Daniel also can be divided really into two parts. And the first six chapters um, have often been described as a heroic fiction. The book of Daniel has 12 chapters. Chapters 1 to 6 record in chronological order the experiences of Daniel and those of his three companions. So the book we, we know was written um, quite late, um, perhaps the end of the third century, those first six chapters. We have a better idea about the remainder of the book. The majority of scholars date chapters 7 through 12 to the middle of the second century. Chapters 7 to 12 contain Daniel's account of prophetic dreams and visions that he received by inspiration. Chapters 7 through 12 are fully apocalyptic in genre, and they were composed between 167 and 164. I don't know if I wrote that up there. Yeah, 167 and 164 BCE. This was a time when Jews were suffering intense persecution at the hands of the Seleucid king of Syria, um, Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV. Um, and so Daniel is the latest book of the Hebrew Bible. 
Right? It, was, it was chronologically the latest book, written between 167 and 164 BCE. But the author writes in code. He writes in code so that you know, some hostile person would not be able to understand. Right? The author disguises his references to contemporary historical um, events and personalities in uh, these visions, these symbolic visions, uh, that are attributed to a remote era of the past. Chapters 2 and 4 describe how Jehovah gives Daniel the ability to interpret two of King Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. Each of these divinely sent dreams has prophetic significance. The dream and its interpretation interests and concerns us today as much or more than it did Nebuchadnezzar. The main themes of this first section of the book of Daniel um, are Daniel's interpretations of the dreams of, of these kings, um, Nebuchadnezzar, and, and his uh, allegiance to his God. The first dream is of an immense image made of various metals. Its head was gold, its breast and arms silver, its belly and sides brass, its legs iron, and its feet iron intermingled and smeared with clay. This image represents successive world powers that have had a major influence on God's people. The divine interpretation of this dream given through Daniel explains that the head of the image was a Babylonian kingdom, the breast and arms the succeeding Medo-Persian Empire, the belly and sides of brass the Grecian Empire which followed, and the legs the succeeding Roman Empire. Each metal represents a kingdom that ruled the ancient Near East. Daniel only explicitly mentions gold as Babylon, but we can figure out the rest. Um, silver is Medea, bronze is Persia, and iron is Alexander's Greece, right? Macedonian Greece that conquered the ancient Near East in the 330s and brought Hellenism and, and, and introduced the Hellenistic period into ancient Near Eastern history. After Alexander's death, his empire was divided into smaller Hellenistic kingdoms. Right? The ones of greatest relevance to us are Ptolemaic Egypt and Seleucid Syria, because as you can imagine, Palestine is caught between those two great powers. So it's going to be fought over by those two great powers. The feet represented the Holy Roman Empire and its successors. The iron of the feet, the civil power. The clay intermingled and smearing over the iron pictured the ecclesiastical power of our day. So the iron and clay feet of the statue in Daniel's dream represent these lesser Hellenistic kingdoms of Egypt and Syria that um, succeeded Alexander's empire and are a mix of Hellenistic and, and Eastern elements. The prophecy ends with the destruction of these powers and with God's kingdom as the only government ruling over mankind. The stone represents God's elect church, gathered out from Jews and Gentiles and from every nation and denomination to constitute Messiah's kingdom. Shortly, this kingdom will be established in power and great glory, and the kingdoms of this world will disappear as by magic. Nebuchadnezzar's second dream features a tree that reaches to the heavens. It is cut down and the stump is banded for seven times. In chapter 4, there's a second dream. Um, it's interpreted by Daniel as a sign that Nebuchadnezzar will be struck down seven times. That lease of power to rule the world as best they could was to last for seven times, seven symbolic years, each day of which lunar time would represent a year. Thus, seven times would mean seven times 360. That is 2,520 years. That period is apparently due to expire in 1915. Years later, despite an official decree prohibiting petitions to anyone but Darius, Daniel violates the edict, of course, and he's arrested and he's thrown into a den of lions. Daniel and his companions maintain their integrity. There is, of course, no historical merit to these stories of Babylonian and Persian kings acknowledging or adopting the God of the Jews who lived in exile among them. Chapters 7 and 8 describe the visions Daniel sees of a series of beasts that picture the rise and fall of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And these, ver uh, these visions, again, survey ancient Near Eastern history from the 6th 
to the second centuries. Chapter 7 again represents the succession of kingdoms, the Babylonian, the Median, the Persian, the Macedonian empires, but this time as beasts. So you have a lion, a bear, a winged leopard, and an ogre. A judgment scene was shown to Daniel, in which all these governments were disapproved, and the dominion taken from them, and given to one who appeared like unto the Son of Man. Now in Daniel, this phrase, the Son of Man, which generally means mortal, uh, um, as opposed to divine in the Bible. But in Daniel, the phrase seems to refer to a figure that's in human form, but more than a human. Probably an angel like Michael or Gabriel. Both of them are represented as um, leaders against the forces of Persia and Greece. And this figure establishes an everlasting kingdom to replace the bestial kingdoms that have preceded it. The kingdom given him was a perpetual one, that all should serve and obey him, and all beastly governments were destroyed. Jehovah gives his son an everlasting kingdom that will replace all human governments. Next, we read that while Daniel is praying, an angel appears to him and reveals details concerning the Messiah. And here Daniel has a series of visions and dreams that are interpreted for him by an angel. And again, that's a classic feature of the apocalyptic genre. The fourth beast represented the Roman Empire. Its ten horns corresponded to the ten toes of the image. The ogre has horns, and the horns of this ogre then represent these two lesser Hellenistic kingdoms, the Ptolemies of Egypt and the Seleucids of Syria. The boastful little horn is the Syrian king, Antiochus Epiphanes himself. The horn that had eyes and was crowned is believed by many to represent ecclesiastical power and throned amid political power. The son of man overwhelms the little horn, Antiochus, who is said to be making war on saints. That's a code for loyal Jews, who, says to, uh, who is said to have been trying to change their law and abolish their religion. And we know that these were parts of the persecution in 167 to 164 by Antiochus. Um, he, you know, he tried to stop uh, worship in the, the sanctuary and so on. In a third vision, then, the horn that represents Antiochus is said to trample the land of splendor, Israel, to challenge the army of heaven, to remove the perpetual sacrifice. Antiochus did halt the, sacrifice, the sacrificial service in the temple, and to set up an abomination of desolation on the sacrificial altar. And we know that Antiochus set up some kind of pagan altar on the sacrificial altar in the temple in Jerusalem and erected a statue of Zeus in the sanctuary. So this depiction of the persecution under Antiochus is presented here, but it's presented in veiled form for reasons of safety. Now, Jeremiah prophesied, I'm going to do some math now, so this is dangerous. Jeremiah prophesied in the early 6th century, and the chapters of Daniel were written many centuries later. Someone can figure it out in the 160s. So was Jeremiah prophesying falsely when he said that God would deliver Israel from her enemies and establish a kingdom in Judah in 70 years? No, not according to the book of Daniel, because in the book of Daniel, it said that Jeremiah also was speaking in a code. Jeremiah meant that 70 weeks of years, which is to say 490 years, would pass before the consummation of all things. And the last week was the reign of Antiochus Epiphanes. We are in the last week of these years now. The fulfillment of the prophecy would extend to the final part of the days. So the writers maintaining that he's living in the last days, in the final moments of the last week of years, and this is very typical of apocalyptic literature. In other words, the great seventh day of the Genesis account is itself a great week, each day of which is 1,000 years long. The six already passed have been manned work week. The time is at hand. We are in the final stage. This is now all the birth pangs of the Messiah, these terrible things that are being visited upon us. So apocalyptic literature sees history as determined. It's a closed drama that must be played out, um, requiring no action on the part of humans except faithful waiting. God's kingdom will come solely by God's power, but it has to be preceded by this time of trouble. These troubles are nothing but the birth pangs of the messianic age, and the faithful, whose names are recorded in God's book, will be rescued. Yes, may your name be found written in Jehovah's book of life, 
and may it remain there forever. The angel reassures Daniel of God's approval and tells him that, although he will soon rest in death, he will stand up in the resurrection at the end of the days. Chapter 12, 12 imagines a resurrection of the dead as a compensation to those who died under the persecutions of Antiochus. It's a clear attempt to deal with the injustice that mars this world. And it's the only passage of the Bible to explicitly espouse the idea of an individual life after death. And as I say, breaks with a longer Israelite tradition that's vague or silent on this issue. Not all Jews accepted the idea, but it would be essential to the rise of Christianity, which is deeply indebted to apocalyptic thinking. And through Christianity, it came to have a very far-reaching impact on Western civilization. You lose perfect final round fight. But now we ask, will Jehovah answer our pleas for more faith? Most definitely he will. And one outstanding way he has done this is by providing us with Bible prophecy. Prophecies in the book of Daniel alone have helped millions to build rock-solid faith. For example, the fulfilled prophecies regarding the King of the North and the King of the South have been very faith-strengthening. The book of Daniel is a response to specific historical circumstances. It's a response to the crisis of persecution and martyrdom that was going on in the second century. That was a new kind of crisis that led to a new kind of response. Because the earlier crises of 722 and 586, they could be explained as punishment for sin and faithlessness. But now, in the second century, Jews were dying not because they were faithless, but precisely because they were faithful because they refused to obey the decrees of Antiochus and to violate their law and covenant, and they were dying. So this new phenomenon of martyrdom, really, for the first time, required new responses, and the book of Daniel provides a fully apocalyptic response. Remain faithful. Wait, Daniel urges. Know that this will all be set right by God, not in this world, but in an ultimate and cataclysmic triumph of life and death, life, over, life and faith over death and evil, and it will be soon. Has the unerring accuracy of those prophecies strengthened your faith? We're confident that it has. And we're absolutely convinced that the rest of that prophecy, including our deliverance, will be fulfilled. Christ soon will defend God's people and bring an end to this entire wicked system. The question arises, will we have one or more times in the future, or even now when we can say, this is it. So you didn't have that same exciting fervor because of Bible prophecy. Now, why is this of interest to all of us who are here today? And why is it that we all need to be ready? Well, Daniel chapter 11 foretold a rivalry between two kings, the king of the north and the king of the south. Find Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. In the time of the end, the king of the south, here in Daniel 11:40, will engage with him in a pushing. So, the governing body has been prayerfully considering recent events. And we know that in 1991, the Soviet Union came to an end. So who is the king of the North? Well, after prayerfully considering it and the matter of the pushing, uh, we're assuring you that what we see after prayerfully considering it is that Russia and its allies, king of the North. So this is it. At this point, we're confident to share with you Russia and its allies are the king of the north. We're confident this is it. This is the king of the north. So are, is there going to be another time related to Bible prophecy where the faithful slave will be able to say to you, this is it. So thieves are doing their thievery when it's dark, but we're sons of light. So that's not going to catch us. Uh, the faithful ones worshiping the true God, obedient to this earthly part of his organization. 
will the faithful slave be able to say, in the process of the fulfillment of this prophecy from 1 Thessalonians, this is it? That's what we've been waiting for? We'll have to wait and see. <laughs> Leave the channel to handle such matters. If the faithful slave is moved by God's spirit to say that to the brotherhood, and that's his will, fine. But please don't be gullible. Stick with the way Jehovah wants this to operate, and he'll bless your obedience. Thank you very much, Brother Morris, for heightening our eagerness for what lies ahead in the near future. And thank you for removing the veil from the King of the North. This rivalry has stretched out over thousands of years, and it continues down to our day. Well, as Brother Morris so beautifully explained, after prayerful consideration, the governing body believes that Russia and its allies today represent the King of the North. Well, is there anything more that the governing body can say at this time about Daniel chapter 11? The governing body believes that these and other actions of Russia and its allies constitute a part of the fulfillment of the King of the North entering the land of decoration. Well, now, what can we expect? It would not be surprising if Russia and its allies continue to persecute God's people and that that persecution spreads to other lands. Well, now, brothers, this raises a very important question. Does this mean that the attack of Gog of Magog has begun? Well, we're not ready to tell you. Gog of Magog, a coalition of all the nations. Yes, a combination of the King of the North, the King of the South, and all other nations will make plans to attack God's people. At that time, we will stand out as different and will appear to be defenseless. For this reason, Gog will devise an evil plan in a futile attempt to wipe out pure worship from the earth. My theme is the King of the North in the time of the end. In recent years, the Russian government has persecuted our brothers and sisters who live in that country. You've heard reports about the police invading kingdom halls and breaking up meetings. The government has labeled Jehovah's Witnesses as an extremist group. It has seized our properties and imprisoned our brothers. It shouldn't surprise us that this powerful government has been persecuting our peaceful, law-abiding brothers and sisters. Why not? Because that government is fulfilling Bible prophecy. Today, Russia and its allies are filling the role of the King of the North. As discussed in the May 2020 Watchtower, Russia and its allies are not the first political power to act as the King of the North, but they may well be the last. Brother Herman Van Selm, a helper to the writing committee, will help us review some of the key points of the prophecy recorded in Daniel 11. The prophecy in Daniel 11 mentions the King of the North and the King of the South. These powers could be viewed as two thrones. Over time, those thrones have been occupied by various political powers and these rival kings compete for world domination. And what about Jehovah's people? They are right at the center of this conflict. God's people are the focal point of the prophecy recorded in Daniel chapter 11. Well, the Jewish nation was God's people until 33 CE, but after that, a change occurred. Jehovah poured out his Holy Spirit on Christ's followers, and from then on, the congregation of true Christians became God's people. So, from the second century onward, 
we can no longer identify an organized group of true Christians. And as we considered, for that same reason, we also cannot identify the King of the North and the King of the South. But in the 1870s, a group of Bible students began to separate itself from false Christians. This group, which included Charles T. Russell, rejected teachings that were not based on the Bible. And as events that followed prove, this group clearly had God's backing. So from the 1870s onward, when true Christians began to organize themselves as a group, we can again identify the political powers that fill the roles of the King of the North and King of the South. The identity of the King of the North has changed three times during the last days. In time, though, Russia and its allies took on the role of the King of the North. And like the other powers that filled the role of King of the North, this government has continued to oppress God's people. Each detail of the prophecy recorded at Daniel 11 has come true so far. We must have confidence that the remaining events described in that prophecy will also come true. We are living in the last days of the time of the end. We must be convinced that the prophecy in the Bible are trustworthy. Today's texts and comments highlight two subjects. One, a very important event. Two, a very important quality. The event is Armageddon. The quality is obedience. Pure worship is under attack in the country of Russia. How do we benefit now from being obedient? And what is the link between Armageddon and obedience? The attack on pure worship in Russia includes an outright ban on our activities in that land. Now, as explained in the Pure Worship book, chapter 18, after the destruction of all false religious organizations, we as God's servants worldwide may be used by Jehovah to proclaim a final and hard-hitting judgment message. That message may announce that the political system is about to end. Not surprisingly, the kings of the earth will not take that kindly. What can we say, brothers, about this attack on pure worship in Russia? The July issue of the Watchtower of 2015 stated this. Shortly before the remaining ones of the 144,000 are taken to heaven, Gog will attack God's people. Thus, according to this watchtower, the nations will attack us while the anointed Christians are still on earth. Jehovah foretold that during Christ's presence, the kings of the earth and high officials would take their stand against Jehovah and his anointed one. Now, as our publications have long explained, Israel here refers to spiritual Israel. So indeed, the remnant of spiritual Israel, including the brothers on the governing body at that time, will be with us when this coalition attacks us. Thus, we are not surprised to see this direct attack on Jehovah's name, his precious word, the Bible, and his faithful worshipers on this earth. As God's servants, we are obedient from the heart. We are obedient because we love Jehovah. What is the link between Armageddon and obedience? Now, James chapter 3, verse 17 helps us to find the answer. There we read that we need to be ready to obey. Now, the expression ready to obey is a translation of a Greek word that is mentioned only one time in the entire New World translation. Now, interestingly, in the first century, the same Greek word was also used in a military setting. In fact, Josephus wrote that one of the reasons why the Roman army was so successful was that the soldiers were well-trained, ready to obey. Now, how does that apply to us? 
Well, of course, we do not use literal weapons as soldiers do still. There is a similarity between those Roman soldiers in the past and us today. We too have to be well trained and ready to obey. Why? Because the obedience that we develop today will help us to obey life-saving instructions that we will receive from God's organization in the future. When the nations attack us and the war of Armageddon follows, showing obedience will be our protection. Well, what we have reviewed is not just interesting history, it's a dramatic prelude to what will soon happen here on earth. Jehovah has given his people this knowledge so that we can act on it. It should influence the choices we make. As Armageddon comes closer, we will be protected as long as we are ready to obey. How are our brothers and sisters coping with the current persecution? Let's take a look. And what you're going to see will break your heart. At God's command, we declare his message, which is set forth in the Bible and in substance is this, that the day of final settlement of the rulership of the universe is here, and that the issue will be settled at Armageddon, which is near. But all nations of the earth are rapidly assembling for that conflict, and for that reason they are now against Jehovah God and against his witnesses. We are holy and uncompromisingly for Jehovah and his kingdom under Christ. And we're determined that regardless of all opposition, that our lives shall be spent in the interest of the kingdom. To them, the kingdom of God is everything, and, and to God and Christ, they look for salvation. The devil's organization over there, of course, wants to break down Jehovah's Witnesses' organization, the New World Society. And the way they do it is through persecution. When the devil, through his organization, visible and invisible, attacks us through persecution, through trials, difficulties, putting us in prison because we preach the good news of the kingdom, as they do behind the Iron Curtain in totalitarian lands. Be on your guard against men, for they will hand you over to local courts, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and you will be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a witness to them and to the nations. However, when they hand you over, do not become anxious about how or what you are to speak, for what you are to speak will be given you in that hour. And sometime these brothers get the watchtower in these camps. Of course, we don't tell the communists how it gets in, but they get it, they read it, and they discourse in, in their barrack on us. Then we can see the hand of the devil. It's obvious. Often it's very easy for us to stand up against the devil's organization when we are persecuted, because we see our adversary, and we can see the way he works and what he's trying to slow down. They don't know that Jehovah God is running it through his son Christ Jesus. Preaching unto the ends of the earth this good news of the kingdom without let up. We want to be a going organization when the battle of Armageddon comes. Whether it be out amongst the people or whether it be underground. If they force all of us underground, we'll go underground and we'll keep on preaching. And the day may come when they'll put that pressure on you. Everyone who loves God will do his duty by informing the people of the only means of salvation. Do your part regardless of opposition. Jesus and the angels and the 144,000 brothers of Christ will form the heavenly army that comes to deliver us from the coalition of nations. At that moment, they will have both the authority and the power to defend those on earth who supported them so loyally during their trials while they were on earth. Of course, we want to be ready when persecution comes. And quite frankly, brothers, when ban or opposition comes on a level like we have seen in Russia, 
There are things that we need to know in order to be ready. We must follow direction from Jehovah's organization. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 17 says, be obedient to those taking the lead among you. And why? Because Jehovah will use his appointed channel to provide us with the direction that we need so that we can maintain our spirituality. We stand our ground and when persecution becomes too great and they break up our halls, take away our property, we move underground and by Jehovah's undeserved kindness and direction do even greater work. Today in those countries behind the Iron Curtain, there are between 65 and 70,000 witnesses of Jehovah as compared with a few years ago of only 40,000. So the work grows. So it is in all parts of the world, no matter how great the pressure may be. Jehovah's Witnesses will continue to serve their God even though they kill them. Well, as the Soviet Union collapsed, bans were lifted across the former territories of the Soviet Union, as well as in other lands that formerly had been a part of the Eastern Bloc behind the Iron Curtain. Well, what happened then? As we well know, the preaching work opened up in that whole region of the earth, and hundreds of thousands of honest-hearted ones flocked to Jehovah's organization. Well, now, brothers, where do we find ourselves now? All who endure faithfully will ultimately be saved. Soon, Jehovah will act in behalf of all his servants who, despite opposition and adverse circumstances, prove that they are truly a people for his name. No wonder that our text for today comes from a Watchtower article with the title, Armageddon is good news. Yes, it is good news for all those who serve Jehovah in heaven and on earth. A married couple in this country said, following the directions we received gave us peace of mind. And a brother in Peru said, I feel now better prepared to be obedient to instructions yet to come. Simply put, all of Jehovah's people are facing the same attack. Although our challenges may be different, no matter where we live on this earth, we are under attack. As we've been reminded in this update, our brothers and sisters worldwide continue to stand firm in the faith despite military actions, a global pandemic, disasters, and persecution. Continue to listen to the voice of our fine shepherd, Jesus Christ, and his appointed channel, the faithful and discreet slave. You lose. The Watchtower's primary sales strategy targets individuals and families in crisis, people with low self-efficacy and self-esteem. And we can see all the same patterns in the QAnon movement. Superficially, it did seem like it gave me comfort. I didn't realize the nefarious kind of impact it was having on me because it was very insidious how it slowly disconnected me from reality. And so you have people who are essentially looking for answers. And so it's a very compelling narrative to say, all of this is orchestrated. There's a cabal coming after you. They're trying to make your life miserable. You want an answer for why bad things are happening? Here they are. Conspiracy theories cast those who believe them as members of an elite group of people in the know, the us locked in an eternal battle with them, and they often carry an apocalyptic message in which believers are told that very, very soon, the truth of their claims will come to light, and the world and nation will be transformed. At that time, believers will be vindicated and will live in a world that is finally free of them, the scapegoats and enemies who they blame for all their problems. The turning point came when he watched a video that disproved the final part of the conspiracy he believed in. That kind of like shattered me, right? So then I, I just like, I went outside, like I had a cigarette and I was just like, man, I don't know what, I don't know what to do. Like, I, I've never felt so down. Like it was the worst feeling I've ever had in my life. It's like, oh my, I cannot trust my thoughts and emotions anymore. For people who are very deeply entrenched and believing it now, 
is there any way to to sort of bring them back yeah there is but it has to start with empathy and understanding which is non-judgmental and allowing them to keep their dignity because otherwise what's their incentive and on top of that you have to admit you were wrong so wrong for so many years and that you were made a fool of there has to be some sort of incentive and some pathway back jehovah's witnesses are not stupid they're scared jehovah's witnesses are not evil they're ignorant of themselves and of reality jehovah's witnesses don't need to be mocked and they certainly don't need to be persecuted the criminals among them need to be prosecuted but that's only going to happen by first addressing the victim's fears and group dependence and that is why that this is a big problem not just because people are being taken in and their families are like being ripped apart this is this is an existential battle between good and evil that these people think they're fighting joseph rutherford once declared that religion is a snare and a racket so are multi-level marketing companies and pyramid schemes so is the watchtower bible and track corporation but a conspiracy-driven pyramid scheme is not all that the Watchtower Bible and Track Corporation really is. 